drinking. <laughs> so, I don't know if there's any way to adjust this projector zoom, is there? That'll do. Down. That's fine. So I'm going to be talking about <coughs> how we build the Razorback virtual appliance um, for um, a number of reasons. Uh, the first is Razorback is a, a quite complex system, um, and we need to be able to reduce the barrier to for people. Um, it's the last thing you want somebody to have to do is set up. MySQL and ActiveMQ and Memcached and 25 other packages before they can even trial the system. So it's basically what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm a senior research engineer with the Source5 vulnerability research team. I'm a primary developer on Razorback. Um, before that, I was at Mintel and I was. Uh, head of their global infrastructure, managing the fleet of 1,500 FreeBSD boxes, providing business market research. So I'll tell you a little bit about Razorback so you can kind of understand why we had to build the appliance. Um, it's an open source security framework that allows for near real-time advanced data inspection that we can't do in the IPS. A lot of the file formats these days are too complicated to us in simple signature patterns in the IPS at 80 gigs a second. So we're going to design a technology that can collect the data and then push that out into a back-end analysis farm for processing and detection and alerting. So we have a capture an inspection framework that allows data to come into the system and be tagged with a data type. And then you have inspectors that analyze specific types and know about how to deal with those types. And then we route those inbound data blocks through into the inspectors for analysis and then alert from the inspection systems back in and then dispatch that back out into the output system. It kind of gives you an overview of what's going on inside the VM. Um, as you can see, there's a fair few working and moving parts there. Um, that doesn't include all of the, the inspectors that we run. Uh, we have a bunch of Windows inspectors that obviously we can't package in the um, FreeBSD appliance. I mean, good luck trying to get Kaspersky to run on uh, Wine. Um, but each one of these components has at least one config file and at least one uh, other piece of configuration that you're probably going to have to do to get it to, go, to be up and running. So this is a kind of an overview of why we built, built the appliance. We needed to improve the adoption of Razorback for within large enterprises. Um, we were reluctant to install to try and install such a complicated system without being able to, to demo it first because even our development team, it takes a day to set up a Razorback instance for. So um, it looks like this text's a little too small. I can't read it down here. So you probably can't read it out there. <laughs> So the other thing that we wanted to do was provide a simple management interface for people to manage Razorback because um, out of the box it's designed with no real management interface. You use standard Unix management practices to manage what's going on, remove move files around, put config files in place, that kind of thing. So we needed some simple web interface for people to be able to control the system and uh, make it what they wanted. Why did we choose FreeBSD? Well, I got a reasonable amount of experience with FreeBSD. Uh, it's our 
development, continuous integration targets. Uh, we run every single revision on it. Um, and it's one of our uh, officially supported platforms that we will officially fix bugs on, I guess. Uh, it tends to be more secure than some of the other options that are around. Um, it's got less bleeding edge components and things like that. Has a better track record. And uh, familiar to, familiarity with ports. I don't know how many of you have tried to write a Debian package in comparison to a port. Uh, a, a port is significantly simpler. And uh, the other thing is, has anybody ever tried to use the VMware Appliance Builder? It's the manual's about two inches thick. So I didn't want to have to learn something new when I know, knew I could do it this way. So um, I can give you a, an overview of what we're building into the appliance. We need a systems management interface because the people that we're targeting aren't necessarily going to be familiar with FreeBSD or Linux. They might be Windows users that are interested in this project. So we need a way for them to be able to manage the basics, the users, the IP addresses, the network services, and things like that. We need a management interface for Razorback so that we can configure what inspection processes are enabled in the system and how they're configured. Some of them have. Um, API keys and things like that that you need to configure them before they'll even run. Um, and we need to run the analysis, the uh, analyst interface and back end for Razorback so that you can actually use the system. The main thing that we had to choose was the, to decide on was the system man management interface. There were really two options at the time when we were building the appliance to start with. There was the, the free NAS interface and there was the there was web. <coughs> we uh, looked at the pros and cons of both. FreeNAS is quite extensible. In the latest releases, they have a nice plug-in API um, that you can build your own components into the system and then upload them as a plug-in into the web interface, and you get all sorts of good integration with the main management UI. Um, it's written in Python and Dojo. And uh, we'll work with NanoBSD if we decided to package on NanoBSD rather than as a traditional FreeBSD installation. Webmin seemed fairly extensible. It had a lot of features that we didn't need. Uh, it was about able to control a lot of things that we just didn't care about and we didn't think that our users wanted to care about. Um, and it was Perl rather than Python, but. Nobody really cares what language it was in. We just we wanted something that wasn't overly complicated. The FreeNAS interface looks a lot better than the Webmin interface as well, out of the box. So. The uh, the first thing that we ended up having to do was pull out the FreeNAS web interface and the back end for the management system. Um, we started off at, with pulling out straight from their SVN trunk. Um, just after they released 8.0. Uh, so we had a, a fairly bleeding edge copy of the, the front and back end for the, the FreeNAS uh, code base. We then reworked the back end to remove various references to IX and make it more generic, uh, remove all the references specific to, to FreeNAS and remove the FreeNAS branding from all that stuff. Um, and allowed for the back end to run on both a traditional FreeBSD free system and a NanoBSD based system because the, there were a lot of assumptions in the back end code base that assumed that the uh, management scripts were all running in a NanoBSD environment which has various restrictions about what pieces of the file system are read write, what, what pieces are read only and uh, where config files would be and things like that. Then we, uh, we, t we did the same thing with the front end. We removed all the, um, the FreeNAS specific branding, and we made all of that, that configurable. So now you can take the, 
the FreeBSD admin project, and you can throw in your vendor product logo, your vendor logo, your product name, configure a config file, put your links to your various things in, and then you get your custom version of the management interface with very little work. Um, and then we decided that we'd put it on Salesforce so anybody else can use it. So if anybody's interested, let me know. Um, so after we'd done all that, we then had to customize the FreeBSD admin or FreeNAS interface to, uh, to add the features that we needed. So we ended up adding, adding new service configurations. Um, I don't know how many of you you have used FreeNAS, but we've got this services tab. So we had to add a bunch of new stuff to, to that. We had to add MySQL for the, uh, the back-end data store for Razorback. ActiveMQ for its message passing. Um, it's some Razorback specific stuff to control various Razorback services uh, and Clam AV. And we added Snort as well, which I seem to have forgotten off the list. Um, and then we provided our own custom branding and uh, a new uh, Django application that we added into the. Um, the admin project, the, free, the uh, project that allows us to configure various portions of Razorback, um, which are not didn't fit within <coughs> the existing service configuration control. So this is what we ended up with, but you can't really see that. So this is our version of the interface, and we've down what things were available, provided for service management, turn things on and off in the appliance. You can also control various components of Razorback, configure your various pieces of configuration and apply those in the back end and it will automatically restart the appropriate services for uh, and bring that uh, thing online and now we can once we've configured it we can bring the nugget online and it will re go back and restart the back end and bring that that component online in within the system so I'm sure you're quite interested in the, the how you would go and build an appliance that was our next next trip kind of trial. We didn't want to use NanoBSD because we didn't want to have the head of a custom build. We wanted people to be able to run BSD update within the appliance to update things. We wanted them to be able to install a ports tree if they wanted to and install extra things and be able to write scripts and install extra packages. So we didn't want to give them the restriction of a NanoBSD system, which is, for the most part, read-only. Um, so we went with a traditional FreeBSD install. Um, initially, I just created a FreeBSD virtual machine and installed some stuff in it by hand, popped the files around, and snapshotted it every time I wanted to release a test or do a, a real release. Um, it took three or four days to update the appliance to the latest version and send it out to QA and get all the <coughs> testing back. and. It was basically slow and painful, so we decided we needed to uh, make something a, a little more repeatable, and we ended up with a PXE installation environment that you boot a clean virtual machine by PXE, um, and it will then do a fully automated installation of the management interface and all the packages and provide the base configuration ready to export to an OVA file from the hypervisor, and then we, which we then upload to SourceForge. Uh, in future, it would be nice if the build you went into the build environment and you said, build VM, and it built the VM in the target VM in the hypervisor and turned it on, waited for it to do its thing, and then turned it off and exported it into an OVA. But we, that's a lot of work for, for something that we can do by hand in maybe 15 minutes. So it's a, something to think about in the future. Um, the uh, network layout is quite simple. We have a build controller which has all of the services for 
deploying the virtual machine, and then we just have the appliance target VM on a private network within the, the hypervisor. So the, a host only, uh, a private, an internal only network in VM where, or uh, virtual box or whatever your choice of hypervisor is. So building the, uh, the VM process that the VM goes through, we basically, the first thing that we do is we boot the VM from uh, via PXE and we launch an installation image of FreeBSD on NFS root. Um, and that NFS image has all of the things that we need to install in it, all our scripts and stuff like that. Then we launch, once that's been uh, finished from rc.local, we launch PC sysinstall in automated installation mode, which deals with most of the installation automation, in partitioning, installation of the base image, package just uh, installation, all that kind of thing. So once we've done the base installation, PC sysinstall then has a bunch of custom commands in it that um, install the admin file system overlay, the web interface, the backend scripts, um, and then initialize the SQLite database for the, um, the admin web interface, and then the, uh, does some, on the Razorback version, does some custom post installation for the Razorback system, like initialize the uh, sample database in MySQL, and uh, copies of a bunch of extra config files around and things like that. So on the build controller, we need um, an NFS server to host the, the root file system for the installation, the virtual machine during installation. Uh, we need DNS to keep various things happy. Um, NFS and stuff like that. Prefer it if you have working forward and reverse DNS. Um, obviously, we need a, a DHCP server and a TFTP server to serve up the FreeBSD PXE loader. And then we use Tinderbox for building binary packages um, and FTP daemon to serve up the packages. Um, the, the FTP um, is used to serve up the FreeBSD wild packages that PC sysinstall uses to install the base system. We were having trouble getting it to deploy those from the web server, so we had to. We just went with FTP. We have a fairly small package list on the build controller itself. Um, it's a very a, a lightweight 9.0 um, base system with DHCP server, MySQL for Tinderbox, Apache to serve the Tinderbox packages, and so you can monitor the the builds. Um, LFTP for Tinderbox again. Subversion, so we can get the FreeBSD admin code base, and uh, obviously a DHCP server, and rsync we use for uh, for copying files around. It works uh, a little better than a recursive copy. Um, so build controller network, we have uh, we have two interfaces on the build controller. We give it one on our our LAN so that we can access it, SSH to it, edit config files, stuff like that. And then we give it a second interface on the, the build um, virtual segment that we run DHCP on. Um, if we run it, we, in our particular environment, we run the primary interface on DHCP. So we have a little uh, override to the DHCP client configuration to make sure that the virtual machine always uses the local DNS server, which has the um, zone that is used in the installation boot <coughs> segment, um, which we'll see on the next slide. So we provide a very small install.local zone that we provide host names and from for the both the installation controller and the target VMs. So we need forward and reverse for those. Um, so the the appropriate config files if you're building more virtual machines then obviously you can expand both the, the forward and reverse hostname sections to get more more IPs. Um, 
and we have to customize name D a little bit. We add the two zones to the bottom of the config file, and uh, we make sure that it's listening on the installation segment uh, because by default it just listens to localhost. Uh, next thing we have to configure is DHCP, um, which we go through fairly easily. But we have to add a few options. We have to tell it that it needs to load the uh, PXE bootloader the file name, which is kind of in the middle here. I don't know whether the font is big enough for you to see. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, then we tell it where to route, uh, mount the uh, root file system from, which is the basically a, a second FreeBSD9 image extracted on the build controller, and the server name used for uh, PXC, where it's going to grab this PXE boot from, and the DHCP servers identify. And then the rest of it is just a standard, very simple DHCP server. Next thing we need to do is configure the various file servers that we need. Um, we need a user for anonymous FTP, uh, which isn't enabled by default for obvious reasons in the base system. So we had a uh, FTP user with its home directory set to a slash install. And then we export that vol the same volume to the installation subnet via NFS. Um, and we enable both TFTP and FTP in INETD and set TFTP to serve files out of install TFTP. And we have to enable that stuff in our c.conf. Uh, it would be nice if NFS server enabled it all of these things for you, but because <laughs> you always need them if you have the NFS server enabled. Um, we'll walk through next deploying the NFS file system for the installation time image that we're going to run. So we're basically going to use a the 9.0 CD and uh, copy that out into install NFS and uh, use that as the base of our, our operating system for our, the, the, the appliance boots in insta uh, installation time. Um, after we've copied that out, we take the, the PXE loader out of the, the installed boot volume, the installed images boot uh, directory, and we throw that into TF, the TFTP uh, root so that the, the PXE uh, firmware on the NIC can pull that out. Um, then we have to make a little clutch around PC sysinstall. Unfortunately, the version of PC sysinstall that ships in, in 9 doesn't support the layout of the 9 release media because it was the, the when 9 released with the new BSD install rather than with traditional sysinstall. When the release images were built, the sysinstall hadn't up with the new layout of the, the actual image portion. So we have to create a, uh, an image to use in PC sysinstall by combining two portions of the, the distribution files. We need to take the, the base image and the kernel and turn those into a, a single tarball. By, so we just copy the, the base image, uh, uncompress it, and then append the kernel image to the base image and recompress them both. Um, then we have to set up a TumpFS volume for the um, virtual machine that's being installed so that it doesn't place uh, temporary files back on the NFS root volume when multiple machines are, are booting, uh, which would be, uh, would be bad because they override various uh, configuration files and things that PC system stores are assumed just for the local machine rather than shared amongst multiple machines. Um, and we uh, enable our uh, diskless and tumpfs in our conf and the 
um, installation image and uh, tell PC sysinstall to run at the end of rc.local. Um, that's a fairly o a sim oversimplified kind of configuration. As I'll guide you through, walk you through a, the the real rc.local a little later. Um, the next thing we need to do is deploy Tinderbox. So we've got to set up and secure MySQL. Configure PHP so it doesn't whine about the time zone properly at the top of every page. And uh, customize the, the web interface uh, files that don't get configured when you run setup in Tinderbox. Uh, and we're going to run through the a very simple Tinderbox setup. This is stripped down version of the Tinderbox installation from the README, run the setup script, export the Tinderbox file system via NFS so that it can use it to mount various portions of the uh, file system as it's doing its work. Uh, reload mount D so it's got the new export and uh, copy a few files around and set up options. We need to configure Apache with the appropriate configuration for Tinderbox as well. Um, set up where serving of logs and packages and things so that the installation image can pull out the packages from the web server. Um, then we need to uh, set up some environment in the uh, for Tinderbox jail that we've created that we're going to create. It's basically set the a few variables that may not be cor set correctly that if you want to do cross building. So your build controller is AMD64 and your target machine is i3D6. This just guards against that. The uh, things like uname returning wrong architecture when asked and uh, packages being built for the wrong architecture. Um, after that, we have to create a port, a, a build, a FreeBSD build in the uh, in Tinderbox. So we create the uh, a jail first, based on 9.0 release. And there's a if you want to do it by LFTP, you have to install a small patch for Tinderbox because Tinderbox still hasn't caught up with the new 9.0 release dist files either. There are patches out there. Uh, we're just waiting for them to make it back into the, the ports tree. Um, I think if you install if you install Tinderbox from CVS, you'd have those patches. But if you install the port, then you have to buy the patch yourself. Um, we need a ports tree, which we grab as well and set up in Tinderbox. And then we set up a build, which combines a jail and a ports tree for, for package building. And then we start the Tinderbox service. So now we're getting really into setting up the, the FreeBSD admin specific parts of, of the installation. Uh, obviously, we need to check out the code, um, which we put in the, a FreeBSD admin folder under the NFS root of the installation machine. Um, and then once you've checked that out, it comes with a, uh, a little script that will build the base packages for you. So we run that, and it schedules builds for all of the packages that are, um, are required for a base installation in the in Tinderbox for the build specified on the command line there. And that's the build name that you configured in Tinderbox. Uh, after that, you need to generate a package list name that the, uh, the image will I'll install so the configuration file within the image uh, has a list of port names, category, name. Um, but when Tinderbox builds those, the package names don't always match the name of the port that you built. So you can't just strip the category off and do a package add minus r, because for example, the Python ports instead of end up being py27 dash, where originally the port where the port name is just uh, py dash uh, mysql 
the binary package ends up being y27 dash minus qr because the Python infrastructure automatically extends the beginning of the port name with the version of Python that was built for. So you have to generate a package list from the, and that goes through the Tinderbox database and, and gets the package names later use within the installation environment. Then we have a small script to fix a bug in another bug in PC Sys install um, that well, it fails in auto installation mode. There's a, a misplaced variable that's no longer required, so that script just runs a small set over one of the, the PC sys install backends and removes that misplaced variable for you so it will actually run. And then we need to put rsync into the image. Uh, rsync only links against libc, so we can just copy the one that we installed from the base, the build host space image straight into the installation route without having to faff around with installing a port into your route and things like that. By that point, you're pretty much ready to, to create a virtual machine, um, which you uh, configure with a, a primary NIC in uh, installation VLAN or virtual, uh, virtual network. If you're using VirtualBox, um, the PC sys install assumes that you're running off a SCSI disk rather than an ATA disk, so make sure you configure the disk controller to be SCSI rather than um, IDE. Otherwise, PC sys install will fail to find the, the disk that is going to create the root file system in. It tends to be a little more portable if you want to make the VM run in, uh, when you export the OVA, have the, uh, the VM run an ESXi or VMware workstation and things like that. Um, and make sure that it's got PXE enabled. So if you're running VirtualBox, then you need to install the binary extensions for, for VirtualBox uh, to get the boot ROM and things like that. Then you pretty much literally just boot the virtual appliance, let it do its thing, shut it down, and uh, export the OVA. I will show you in action. Hopefully it works. So, first I wanted to show you uh, yeah. I'll try to use the bottom. <laughs> Maybe the no, that's the wrong one. Let's just go down any further. No. So the the rc.local that was in the in the slides is a little is an oversimplification. We have a more advanced rc.local that allows you to override what profile you wish to install. So you can set up build profiles um, within your installation image, and then you can build virtual uh, multiple target appliances from a single build controller. So when you come through, it will it will ask you what profile you want to boot to. Um, install and what package set you want to install the packages from if you're going to if you're doing upgrades you can then set up a new build in tinderbox and build your package set with newer packages and then when you boot the appliance you can just type in the new build name um, it's an yeah just a very a very simple virtual machine that's one of the things that I was was thinking about doing is creating a an appliance which was a build controller that you could then just install and then customize your customize that to uh, build more appliances from it. That's basically the way VMware do it with our stuff. You install an appliance and use that appliance to build other appliances. So, um, but first you have to have to have the system to build appliances. So you got to solve the, the chicken and egg race there. Um, so then we copy both copy the auto installation configuration out of the base. The role that, the profile that we're going to install and uh, store the question, the answers to the questions that we asked in Tomp so that we can use them later in some scripts. Um, 
and I'll show you the auto install.conf as well. This is the auto install configuration. First thing we have to do is tell PC Systems to install where to get the installation from. Uh, in this particular example, we use the same configuration for the auto install as we configuration as we do for the actual installation. So it just uses itself. Um, we set up the host name, we tell the PC Systems install that we're doing a fresh install um, and that it should find a network and use DHCP to configure that. Um, do a simple partitioning, say DA0 if you've got other hypervisor targets and you, you, you've got ATA devices that you want to target and you just simply change this section of the config file to, so it will find a different disk. And then we do a partition that with a fairly small root file system. Uh, uh, it's not a fairly small root file system. Uh, yeah, it is. Reasonably small root file system and we just create a huge VAR because most of the Razorback data ends up in VAR. So, um, and this is the, the specifics of the installation. Um, we tell PC system install that we're doing a FreeBSD install rather than a PC BSD install. We're going to do it in uh, as an image rather than from system install type packages and uh, insert the root password in here to, uh, so that it won't, PC system store will set the root password on the appliance when it comes back up. Then we, uh, we copy in resolve.conf into the target, uh, into the root file system of the virtual appliance so that we can use it later. And uh, we copy in the um, package build set configuration file and the list of packages that we need to install in uh, and we in, we mount devfs inside the, on the uh, the targets so when we cheroot with the the run script command in um, from pc system install which does a cheroot into the target v it copies the script the target vm uh, the target file system and then runs the script in a cheroot that those things are available because certain things like Python and things like that don't like uh, not having DevU random and various other devices available as they install. Um, then we run a bunch of other scripts. We install the package set. We install the, the FreeBSD admin files. And then we initialize the FreeBSD admin uh, SQLite database as well from, the, from PC Sys install. And uh, I wonder if I, uh, if I turn the lights out completely, whether that will be easier. No, that's not the. There we go. So this is my target virtual machine. Um, that where I will in would export the appliance. I would export this virtual machine after, and it would have all of the uh, appliance configuration on it. So it's asking us what on the bottom of the screen. It's asking us what install profile we want to use and what package build we want to use. And so now it's uh, it's launched a PC system store now and is partitioning the uh, partitioning the disk and putting the new file systems on the on the uh, virtual disk.
That's downloading our complete file system image of uh, uh, nine release and extracting it into uh, onto the new partition it's, it's just made. running all our custom scripts now and it's uh, now it's fetching the packages from the tinderbox server and uh, basically installing them all takes a minute or two. Uh, Fuse is loaded by OpenVM tools. Um, it's used if you want. So we, we install OpenVM tools in. So if you uh, deploy this in ESXi, you have the, the integration management tools installed. So it's a dependency of, uh, of those. It's for the HTFS portion of uh, of OpenVM tools, which gives you file system sharing between the host and the, the guest. And of course, you can't build anything without getting some portion of X11 on your server. <laughs> That's going through and installing the uh, FreeBSD admin web interface and back end at the moment. And now it's initializing the uh, SQLite database through a sequence of uh, Django migrations to uh, add the initial configuration data. And it's done. So hopefully it will boot and give us uh, Give us a list of IP addresses that it's configured to run on. This time it's booting from the, uh, the local disk rather than from that. The, uh, the admin interface by default configures all the network cards in DHCP. So when you first deploy the appliance, if you deploy it in a DHCP environment, it will always get an IP address. And uh, I gave this a second network card with a, ho a host-only interface so that I could uh, show you the management after it boots. So this is the freshly installed appliance. Um, this has got more things turned on in the, the configuration than the uh, Isabac appliance does. So we, you can change through various settings. You can change whether or not these things are, are displayed in the admin interface. Obviously, for Isabac, we don't need any file sharing, so we hide that. Um, so you can go through, and this is basically a at this stage, this is basically a free NAS box, um, ready for customization to whatever you want to make your appliance do. Um, I have this all in um, in SVN on SourceForge at the moment. I was talking with. 
Yeah, no, no, that I've, I've been working on this. Uh, I spoke with, uh, with Matt from IX yesterday about this, actually, and uh, I s have started importing um, Freenas trunk um, interface back into this, because at the moment this is a fairly old snapshot. Um, and once I get this integrated back with uh, the, ver the trunk version of uh, the Freenas management interface, um, then it will be much easier to maintain going forwards, and then we'll be able to push back to, to Freenas and say, here's some changes that we made that makes this interface better, and then we can push that all back into the Freenas repo and uh, basically get rid of the FreeBSD admin repo. Um, I think it worked. <laughs> so, a few uh, bits of information in case you uh, you want to copy them down. Uh, the FreeBSD admin project's all up on uh, on SourceForge. Um, there's uh, the Razorback project also open source on SourceForge. Uh, contact information if you want to email me about any of this stuff and uh, some contact information for the vulnerability research team if you have any uh, questions about Snort or Cloud AV that you may want answered. I will be set giving these to, uh, to Dan and uh, to go up onto the um, BSD CAN site. Are there any questions? Oh, I'll turn the lights back on. Yep. The uh, question was, do, is there any uh, experience with runtime performance of FreeBSD on VirtualBox? Um, as hypervisors go, VirtualBox is pretty good. Um, it hypervisors, it really depends on the workload you're running. I use VirtualBox for, for all my development work um, because it means I can move my virtual machines from my Mac to my to wherever. But in production, we run ESXi. So, anybody else? Yep. Could you consider using DNS for, you know, DNS, DNS. The question was, the question was, would it, would it consider using DNS mask instead of all the ISC uh, components? Um, it's an option. You can use it. I have no experience with DNS mask. I have plenty of experience with all the ISC related tools, so I used what I knew. They're all part of base for the <coughs> most part, so I didn't see. And installing one port just for the DHCP service in, didn't seem too much for me. So, but if you wanted to use DNS mask instead of that, I'm sure it would just work as well. You had a question as well. Um, what exactly was PHP? Uh, PHP is the Tenderbox web interface. So if you uh, So the, the, oh, the lights, sorry. Yeah, it just allows you to see the states of the builds a bit easier than using the command line. And to, uh, this, is only on, this, this is only on the build controller. This isn't actually in the appliance. So there's no PHP actually in the appliance. The appliance, the Razorback appliance, has uh, Rails and Django in it. It's two separate web applications, but there's not. And the FreeBSD admin interface is is Django and Python and Django running in a Lighty server. Um, yep. Um, I haven't. Cons uh, but I'm sure it will probably just work. Um, I don't know the details of building an EC2 image, so. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. So it's a very good idea. Um, one of the problems with Razorback is it's very CPU intensive. So running it on EC2 is not necessarily such a great idea from a cost perspective. Um, but I, I guess to reduce further people having to set up hypervisor, it would be great to do that. So that's probably something I'll look at. Yes. Razorback itself is GPL2, like, so, like uh, all source fire products, uh, Snort and uh, Clam AV, they're all, they're all GPL2. Yep. Do you talk about doing upgrades and patching? The question was, have you thought about doing OS upgrades and patching? Um, FreeNAS accomplishes that by replacing the entire image every time because it's based on NanoBSD. Um, and because we needed the ability for people to deploy, to install extra things to be able to test out various scripts and things and inter interfacing with Razorback, um, we left the system as a, a pure FreeBSD installation, which means you can use the standard tools to do the upgrades, so Portmaster or uh, FreeBSD update, or download the use CVS up to get source and build a new world and install that. But obviously that does require a little bit of knowledge about FreeBSD to do that, but um, in production, the virtual machine is not particularly useful. The virtual machine, the virtual appliance is really there to get uh, people to try the system and see what it can do. It's not really intended for people to use in a production environment because to run Razorback on the types of network that people are using you need about 50 cores. So, so, how, so how would they um, On this system, you could just pixie boot a real machine. You might have to change, uh, change a few things, but you could just expose the installation network to real Ethernet ports from your hypervisor and uh, plug in a brand new Dell box and press F12 and have it boot from PXE and you'd get basically the same system. Yep. Uh, any uh, consideration for using uh, Postgres or a different database? The question is a consideration for using Postgres or a different database. Uh, my hands were tied in database selection. Uh, SourceFi uses MySQL in the product and therefore has support contracts for MySQL. So we were told we had to use MySQL when we built this. You had a question as well? If you had your choice uh, in having a mountable virtual image, would you just copy and install directly onto that, or do you prefer using a PC boot? So the question is having a, a customizable image, I'm guessing, right? A virtual machine image. Well, uh, if, you could, if you could mount a virtual disk onto a build machine, would, oh, you, mount, would you just uh, install directly onto that to build the image? Uh, that's talked about that. He has some scripts that will, you can create a, a raw disk with DD, create file systems in it, configure and install into, and then he has a script that will build, convert that into a VMDK and build an OVA file around that. Um, there are some pros and cons of doing that. Uh, one of the, the cons is that you can't test the image after you've done the installation. So you, can't, you have to go through another hoop and deploy the OVA file in a hypervisor to be able to test that it's actually going to boot and do what you thought it was going to do. Whereas if you build it in the hypervisor, when it reboots, you can do some simple testing before you ship to QA. Anybody else? Yeah? <laughs> what what uh, components of the VMware tools do you actually use? Um, we don't use any of the, uh, the question is what components of VMware tools do we use? Uh, is that in relation to the uh, the ones that are installed inside the hypervisor or, okay. So the, what components of open VM tools do we use? We install those so the people deploying in VMware can pause and things like that and have good integration with a VMware um, host. Um, 
they can use the backup utilities that come with VMware and things like that, which have to be able to quiesce disk activity and things to create a snapshot. Uh, most of the people that will be that consume the image are uh, big corporations um, that will run VMware rather than VirtualBox. So these are people that have got Workstation 8 licenses and things like that. So. Anyone else? Yep. Does it? I didn't realize the Tinderbox Devar had the port, so yeah, I can update this. I can make that quick change to the, uh, the slide and before I send them over to, uh, to Dan to put on the site. It's good to know I'll update the website as well. Anybody else? Uh, so the question is, have you considered using Tinderbox Devel from ports rather than Tinderbox? Because uh, apparently it has all the patches in it already. So, and there's nothing in Tinderbox Devel that's too experimental to use in a production Tinderbox. If you've used Tinderbox Devel for production Tinderboxes before, and it works just fine. So. One more question. I missed the limit building an EC2. So... Um, the limitations of building an EC2 image for for general purpose virtual machines um, EC2 probably works quite well uh, for Razorback being a CPU bound and system um, deploying on EC2 can be quite expensive so uh, if you have a big checkbook then you can deploy on EC2 um, Right, um, but and with with Razorback, the type of customer that's installing the virtual appliance can't use EC2. Talking defense contractors, government agency, they wouldn't deploy a security system on EC2 in a public cloud. Um, so for us, there's no real real benefit of building an EC2 specific image other than for people that aren't under the same restrictions. Right. Okay. I mean, I guess you could run because the, the virtual machine has a, a small collector on it. So I guess if we built an EC2 image, the small collector, then we could, then people could run those on their, their EC2 virtual networks. So it's a, it might be worthwhile looking at an EC2 image, at least giving FreeBSD admin support for building EC2 images. You can build a, a ton of into the cloud. Right. I don't. Um, I guess that's one of the advantages of using Git. Um, personally, don't really like Git, but we could always put it into a Git repo so that people can branch and then we can pull those back into kind of a central repository. Anybody else? Uh, as everybody else uh, is here, the VRT is also hiring. So if anybody fancies a change, this is basically the kind of environment we work in. So. <laughs> Feel free to contact me. <laughs>